we just left off on, we finished off the stereotype threat, right? All right, cool. Uh, and again, that one is an odd one. It, it's really just, you're either ang angry or anxious, and that's going to obviously upset your test performance. Um, yeah, it could be, it could be, talk about a stereotype, could be any factor, but anxiety, anything that breaks your focus basically from a test can, can uh, very easily affect your results negatively. Uh, you want to be, of course, not concerned about <clears throat> anything specific that would cause anxiety or upsetness. You want to be focused on that test. So anything that breaks that, whether it's alerting people to stereotypes that are not necessarily true or certainly not of the individual, uh, would be one way to do it. Okay, uh, there, so these are all ways that we just, we know can affect your ability to recall things. So, you know, the mood you're in enhances your ability to recall other times uh, you were in that same mood. Uh, or some other ones, the serial position effect, you're more likely to remember the beginning and the end of a list. Those aren't things you can really prepare for. What was the other one we mentioned? Stereotype, what we, I just talked about. The, oh, retrieval cues. Like you kind of, uh, you realize more about what you know as you think about it. Like, you know, if you think about a movie, what happened in it, it often, if you think about one scene, it reminds you of another scene. Or if I can't remember somebody's name, but I can remember like where they were, where they sit, you know, that can help me recall who they are. Uh, and maybe even their name. So it's all like little retrieval cues that we can use. But if you want to intentionally uh, try to help yourself remember something, uh, you can sort of tap into our our uh, innate ability to uh, process uh, to use deep processing. So you want to like give things meaning, and uh, repetition can also be uh, incredibly effective. So what I mean by giving it meaning is uh, you can use a strategy called chunking. So here we got some uh, memory strategies. Enhancing strategies, obviously. Strategies. Uh, number one is chunking. So chunking is where you intentionally learn things in units, things that make sense to go together, right? I don't teach you guys in the same day. We don't talk about this is short-term memory, this is schizophrenia, and this is uh, uh, Freud. Why don't I do that? Yeah, they don't go together. They're not like similarly themed. Like there's no, they each have meaning in themselves, but they have no meaning together, correct? But if we talk about all of the types of memory and all of the ways you can forget, am I more likely to remember those things together? Why? Yeah, because they fit in a cohesive unit, right? It's part of, part of the, I wasn't here, I think it was the sub or, or was it reading, I can't remember, but Gestalt principles, it was the sub, right? For oh, yeah. perception. That's kind of like a human phenomenon where we like naturally lump things together that are similar. Uh, and it helps us remember things uh, that way too. So that's kind of what chunking is. So you're gonna learn things in manageable units, usually ones that uh, are related, right? And that, that's part of deep processing. I'm much more likely to remember something if it's similar or related, associated uh, in the same context, uh, it's part of a story. That's how I'm uh, more able to remember. <laughs> so if you're rehearsing things, trying to memorize them, Learn them in those uh, manageable units, those ones that have meaningful units. Like you don't study for a test and randomly pick things. Uh, you would, uh, of course, try to go in a logical order. Uh, let's do all of the memory stuff, uh, review that together, and then all of the uh, problem solving stuff together, and so on and so forth. So that's chunky. Next, we got mnemonics. Is that the one? Yes. Mnemonics. Fun spelling there. That's you using uh, little tricks to remember things. Um, so it could be uh, the best exa easiest example is when you learn the colors of the rainbow. I'm just the colors of the alphabet. When you learn the colors of the rainbow, uh, one of the common mechanisms for remembering the order of the rainbow uh, is using that an acronym, Roy G. Biv. Uh, I know I saw that in kindergarten when I learned it, and uh, it, it's a common one. So if you want to remember the order, it's really hard to just remember the order exactly. But if you can remember Roy G. Biv as like a name. Uh, it helps you understand uh, or remember the order more clearly. So it's hard to just give you a list and say, memorize this, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Uh, but if I uh, use this acronym, people can recall Roy G. Biv, and then that helps them remember the order of those colors. Uh, so acronyms work, that's what this is essentially. It could be anything though, it could be, uh, oh, what's an example? I do this all the time, what? Louder like you're not uh, whispering. Oh, I'm sorry, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. 
Oh, I haven't heard that one. What is that one? Yeah, that would be another example, right? <clears throat> I'm not familiar with that one, but yeah, that would be an example. It's using an acronym to remember something. Um, I'm trying to think of a non-acronym. <coughs> singing it? Hmm? Like singing it? Like, you know how we sing the states? Yeah, that would work, putting it into a song. That's another, that would be a type of mnemonic. I'm trying to think of, like, tricky ways to remember things. I do these all the time, but I can't think of a specific one right now. Like, if I, if I have trouble remembering which one is which, like, two terms are similar, I'll come up with a way of making one understanding more clear. You got one? This is, I still remember this from like AP World or something. Um, the two types of Buddhism, Theravada through the trees and Mahayana over the mountains. There we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go, yeah. Because so the T and the T. Yeah, that works. So that was one you created or, or that was... No, that you did it. Yeah. I, I didn't even remember doing that. So yes. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so yeah, that's a mnemonic. Remembering which one was which. So like Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism, you don't remember where those were or where they spread to. And then apparently yeah, I created the mnemonic. Uh, Theravada is uh, through the trees, the jungles of Southeast Asia. So that's where it was. And then uh, the Mahayana is over the mountains, over the Himalayas, into China and East Asia. So yeah, that would be an example of a mnemonic. Thank you for remembering that. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. Three... Um, what else do I have on the list for space effect? Yeah. <laughs> this is how I teach you at the beginning of the year, or I, I think I did, hopefully I did, uh, how to study. Uh, and this is part of the Ebbinghaus curve, uh, because if you don't do this, you just forget 80% plus of it pretty quickly uh, after just a few days. However, you make yourself far more resistant to forgetting something if you uh, use it a little bit each day. So that's all the spacing effect is. Uh, Cramming would be doing all of my studying the night before, which might do okay, but you guys have seen the Ebbinghaus curve. Uh, if you go a day after trying to learn something and you go to sleep and you wake up the next day, it's been hours, you'll forget easily 50% of it, all right, generally speaking. Um, but if you use the spacing effect, uh, it makes your memory far more resistant to uh, um, fading, essentially. So don't forget that Ebbinghaus curve. Um, Ebbinghaus is obviously the last thing to got it. That, discovered it and noted it, is most people, you know, after just a few minutes, they've already forgotten like 40% of the information, and then you go a day or a month or whatever, and it drops to the 30s and 20%. But with the spacing effect, uh, if you just learn a little bit and review a little bit each day, uh, it makes your memory far more resistant to uh, forgetting at all, by the way. Uh, and once you reach a certain point, you kind of don't forget it. Um, you might if you don't use it for years, but then, of course, you guys know about the phenomenon of relearning. As soon as you uh, read it again, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that, and it all comes back to you. All right, so that's uh, the spacing effect. And that's why whenever you've got something to prepare for, whether it's a speech or a paper or a test or, or some presentation or an interview, you shouldn't cram it. Uh, and you also shouldn't do it just like by itself too far in advance. Um, you could do it far in advance, but make sure to keep it fresh in your memory each day. Uh, it's also a good way to uh, make something really, really thorough is by rehearsing it, you'll see little errors to like, let's say it is a speech or you're preparing for an interview for a job or something. If you do it a week or two in advance and just let it sit there, uh, it's not gonna do you much good even if you review it right before, but let's say you make it a week or two in advance and you let it sit there and you think about it a little each day, you're gonna find these little errors that you didn't even notice before and you're gonna have a, a product, uh, a speech or a letter, whatever it might be, that is way better than uh, if you just wrote it over a couple days. So it's a, it's a good idea to do stuff in advance, but don't just be like, done, check mark, and throw it away. Not throw it away, but store it away. You should keep it in your mind, and you'll, you'll think of little improvements to it over time, or you'll have a new idea, like an insight. I think you mentioned that, like someone says something to you and you don't have a comeback, and then later on you're like, oh, I should have said this. You'll have those moments too uh, over the next you know, two or three weeks or whatever. So try to do stuff in advance, but, don't, but make like the rough draft of whatever it is. Uh, and that way, as you come up with other ideas, because you will, um, you can insert them and, and by the end you have a much better product. All right, so uh, whether it's studying or whether it's writing a paper or something, you should start it early and then keep it in your mind or keep rehearsing it. You're gonna have a way better memory or a product, whatever it is that you're trying to create uh, for the assignment or the letter or whatever. All right, or a natural product if you're trying to sell something. It's also a good idea. Uh, like for example, for my stuff, I used to just make it and put it up but now I've found it's much better to make the thing and then just have it sit there for a while. Because almost every time, a week or two later, I'm like, oh, I should do this thing. And then I'll go and, and fix it and change it. And, and then it ends up being better when I actually do uh, put it online. Okay, that's the spacing effect. Uh, four is the uh, testing effect. And this is just an effective way of uh, 
learning information and enhancing memory. So this is actually two things. I'm gonna add here too, is, did I put the Feynman technique anywhere in there? I did not, okay. Uh, you can kind of lump this in. We can kind of make this a fifth one, but. Yeah, they're, they're similar. I'll make it a fifth one, say so the Feynman technique. I don't know if his last name was an A or an E. I think it was an E though. This might be an A technique. They're similar and I'll, and I'll tell you why. A great way of studying and learning to remember something is testing yourself on it. Like flashcards are good because not only am I testing myself, but who writes the question or the definition? You do, right? So you put it into your own words uh, and then you, you've created that flashcard, right? Whether it's an actual card or an app or whatever. Uh, so you put it there, so that puts it into your memory and then you're rehearsing it constantly. You're like, here's the term, what's the definition? Or here's the definition, what's the term? That helps you associate the two things and it strengthens that memory or connection or knowledge or association. So that's all the testing effect is. And this is why it's similar to the Feynman technique, which is the best way of learning something. The Feynman technique is basically in every teacher or any time you have to explain something to somebody finds this out uh, or situation you find this out when you have to take an idea whatever it is and then explain it to somebody else you have to understand that thing so thoroughly because otherwise you'll probably explain it poorly and if they ask any questions you're just like uh, I don't know uh, or you have to make something up or, or whatever so the Feynman technique is taking any idea whether it's complex or simple and putting it into the smallest manageable uh, presentation possible. All right, so that, the reason why this works and helps you understand it is, first of all, you have to put it into your own words, all right, because you're not gonna remember my words. If you just write my slide, you probably won't remember a single word of it, you know, a week later. But if you take the words off the notebook slides and you put them into your own words, you are way more likely to remember it because you're condensing it. You're taking something big and complex, making it simple. And what do I have to be able to do no. By taking a, a bigger thing or a complex idea and making it simpler, what am I doing when, I, when I'm in that process? What's, what's basically required for me to do that, assuming that I, what I create is correct? You gotta understand it, absolutely. So not only does it mean you have to understand it thoroughly, uh, but it also uh, puts it into your own words and makes it easier for you to remember. Uh, that's kind of the Feynman technique. Um, so you'll, um, I learned way more about psychology and history than I ever did in college by a, a, a large, large, large margin when I started teaching these AP classes a few years ago. And I still keep learning, by the way. It's not like it stops. Uh, but yeah, I, I majored in history, for example. And uh, like my first, after my first couple years of teaching AP World and AP Euro, I knew like two or three times more than I did through all of college easily. Uh, and the, and they, they intentionally try to make you learn it. Um, so when you have to teach something, you have to be able to explain it uh, and simplify it essentially so you understand it way better uh, than you ever thought you'd be able to and way more thoroughly and for a much longer duration. <coughs> so it's pretty cool. Uh, that's the Feynman technique uh, and that works. Some ways you can sort of help yourself remember things that we humans are naturally attuned to. And I think I've told you this. Your brain's constantly scanning your environment to see sort of where you stand compared to everybody else. How could I tell, by the way, if I consider myself highly ranked or low, low ranked by looking at my brain chemistry? There's something I can look at. Maybe I haven't told you this. There's a certain neurotransmitter that if I believe that my status is high in whatever field it might be, whether it's teaching or football or basketball or writing or whatever, this will be high Whereas if I think I'm a low status person, I'm unsuccessful, I'm not good, I'm not worthy, whatever, uh, this will be low, this neurotransmitter. Pretty sure I told you. Wasn't it serotonin? It's serotonin, yeah. Uh, so the reason why, gotta give you credit for that one. The reason why, uh, this is one of the reasons why anyway, it makes it so much easier for us to remember things in hierarchies is the fact that, like you know, this person's the best or highest ranker, has the most authority all the way down to the bottom, even animals. Uh, the reason why we do that so naturally, remember it so naturally, is that it's part of our circuitry. Like the oldest, some of the oldest circuits, the ones that we share with, you know, crustaceans from 350 million years ago, uh, go all the way back to these hierarchies. So we're we're very sensitive to uh, hierarchies, and and it helps us remember them for whatever reason. So if I can put information. Uh, whatever it might be into a hierarchy, I'm much more likely to uh, remember that actual information. Like for example, if we talked about, okay, if you had AP World, you might remember this, but if I said, all right, uh, you've got, uh, in, in medieval Japan, you had daimyo, 
Uh, you had Shogun. Uh, you had Samurai. You had Merchants. And you had Peasants. Uh, the highest ranked people in that society were the Shogun, uh, and then directly below them, because uh, they were the warlords, and directly below them were their uh, uh, loyal nobles, the daimyo, uh, and they would hire potentially samurai, uh, who were kind of in the middle. And then, of course, you had the peasants, the lowest uh, technical class, uh, which was the working class that did the work. And then the very lowest in East Asia were the merchants, uh, because they didn't, weren't valued because they uh, made money off of the labor of others. All right. Are you more likely to remember my explanation of that or this? Or are you more likely to remember it if I do it this way? Which one do you think you're more likely to remember? The hierarchy, right. It, it, for whatever reason, uh, whether it's our primitive circuitry or whatever, uh, we are much more likely to remember things in hierarchies uh, and in that order. All right, so hierarchies can be helpful if you can uh, put them into it. Oh, and here's the best way, and I can tell you this from personal experience too. Um, Sleep, getting your REM cycle, super important for memories. And you kind of already know this, we, it was part of the unit dreams, like, oh yeah, it helps consolidate memories and all that. It really does, guys, like, no joke. So, I think I told you I just recently figured out that I, I, I had a sleep disorder. We don't know what it is yet. And I would only know this because I went and got the sleep study and it's like, oh yeah, you don't get any NREM3 or REM sleep, hardly. I got zero NREM3 and I got 10 minutes of REM sleep. I'm supposed to get like, you know, 60 to 90. It's like, oh my gosh, so my brain sucks compared to what it could, uh, essentially. So then I figured out uh, a temporary way to get much better sleep, uh, which, again, if you go after it yourself, make sure you're sa it's all safe with your doctor and all that crap so you can't sue me. Uh, but uh, I, I think you use, use some antihistamines, which are just like sleep aids, non-addictive ones, and it really helps me out. My memory instantly, after a few days when my sleep got caught up because I had a huge sleep deficit, my memory got so much better. Like. I couldn't believe it. I was remembering everything. Like there were times where, like, uh, there were times when, like, you know, uh, my son would say, "Oh, this thing." I'm like, actually, no, this is what happened. And brrr, I give like the exact event. And, like, he's like, "Oh yeah, that is what happened." Or my wife. That would happen to my wife too. Whereas before, I'd be like, "Yeah, I don't know. I kind of remember." But now it's like, "Nope, this is exactly what happened. You just said this, and this happened, and we did this, and then after that, we did this, and then they're always like, mm, okay, yeah." <laughs> it's it's crazy. Like, and I can even like in my head rewind the day pretty much. Like I can actually like reverse or forward order, remember exactly what I did and like in my head I can like walk around and actually see the scenes and the lighting and all that stuff. It's pretty crazy. And I've never been able to experience that ever before. So uh, I can tell you firsthand that uh, sleep, getting uh, the correct amount of sleep, uh, hitting all of your uh, REM cycles correctly is uh, probably the single best thing you can do uh, to enhance your memory. But it enhances all of your cognition. So everything we're about to talk about on this cognition unit, uh, the sleep makes all of it so much better. Uh, my self-discipline and judgment, well not judgment, but yeah, judgment, and uh, uh, problem solving, creativity, all that's much, 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 much better uh, when my brain's operating in your maximum capacity. Because uh, if you're not doing it, then you're running on like 60% instead of 90 or 95 or 100 or whatever. So focus on that, man. <clears throat> if you're struggling with anything, focus on that. And it's not just cognition, it's your hormones and everything else. It, it regulates all of those things. So I didn't quite realize how important it was until I experienced it myself. So make sure to do it um, if you're not. Anyways, so those are the uh, things you can do to improve your memory. Any questions about those? Sweet. I could probably done that in five minutes, but instead we did it in 20. So there we go. Um, next is, oh, forgetting. Okay, so I talked about the amnesias and interference. Okay. So forgetting, so that's how to bolster your memory. Uh, and now let's learn about how you forget or some of the phenomena that can cause you to forget. <coughs> All right, so uh, amnesia, is, amnesia is basically the inability to either store, uh, encode slash store or retrieve memories. Um, anterograde versus retrograde. Which one's which? Someone tell me. 
Antrograde is where you can't remember new memories, and retrograde is when you can't remember old memories. Well, you can't even form them. It's not that you can't remember them. Yeah. Yeah, you cool. can't even form new memories. Correct. Uh, so let's say, oh, I give you the example of my friend, right? Uh, Brad with the snow, and he slipped and got a concussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he temporarily had <coughs> anterograde amnesia. He could not make new memories. Could he remember what happened before? Yes, but he could not form the new memories. In fact, he still doesn't know what happened in that two-day period because he was unable to uh, form, store, and retrieve those memories uh, and encode them. So that's uh, basically inability to form new memories. And then, of course, retrograde is the opposite. Uh, inability to recall retrieval memories. All right, uh, so this person might have a short term memory, but maybe the long term memory is uh, severely impaired or gone, depending on, on the uh, situation uh, and the person. Uh, those are the two types, all right? So failure to make new memories, failure to uh, uh, retrieve old memories. You can also have, I think this is further in the notes, but I'm going to talk about it here. This is basically an encoding failure, maybe a storage failure. And this is a uh, retrieval failure and maybe also a storage failure. Um, so you've all heard of deja vu, right? Like, I've seen this before. I don't remember how to spell it, actually. But that's what I'm going to write. <coughs> deja vu is, I, did you, someone asked me, did you ask about it before? Somebody back there asked it before. Oh, Sal, OK. Um, so deja vu is when you, uh, Think you see something? No, I didn't explain this to you. Somebody else asked earlier in the year. It was you, yeah. I remember correctly. I got my sleep. So, anyways, um, <laughs> but yeah, I do remember you mentioning it before. But but someone asked me and I explained. It. I was like, I'll talk about this later. So I'm going to re-explain it again in case you forgot. Deja vu is basically a retrieval failure. So it's when your mind has triggered a memory, but it fails to actually recall what the memory was. So you have this moment. Uh, where your brain goes, all right, I remember this thing, and it goes to pull it, but there's a retrieval failure. And we've learned this before. When my brain doesn't know why something happened, does it just go, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm lost. What does it do? It yeah, it rationalizes it, right? And we learned this, by the way, with the uh, uh, split hemisphere studies, when they uh, split the corpus callosum, and they would, like, you know, tell one hemisphere something, uh, and then they'd get up to go uh, complete the task, but, be since only the, but since only the right hemisphere got the information, like the left eye saw it or whatever, uh, they couldn't tell me why they got up because their left hemisphere had no idea. Uh, and what would they say? Like, you told them to get up and leave, and what would they say? Like, I'm thirsty, I got to, got to get a Coke or whatever. They'd make something up instantly, right? And they're not even thinking about it, they just, that's their automatic uh, response to it. All right, uh, so your brain, when it's confused and doesn't genuinely know, it just makes stuff up. It, it literally tries to rationalize why you're doing things. So this is an instance where you try to pull a memory and your, your brain knows it tried to pull a memory. So you have this feeling of familiarity, but your brain doesn't know why you feel familiar because it failed to pull the memory. So what does it do? Since you have this feeling of familiarity, what does it do? It rationalizes it. It like associates that moment. Yep, it rationalizes it as this is the moment I'm remembering even though you've probably never seen that exact moment before, right? I could have deja vu here in class because I see you guys all the time, but if it's a specific instance, it probably didn't happen exactly the way that I remember it before. All right, so that's all deja vu is. It's basically just retrieval failure. Your brain goes to pull a memory. It fails to do it, and has, but it has this feeling that it's supposed to remember something, so it's like, oh, uh, it's this thing that you're looking at. That's what we saw. That's it. That's it. You've seen this before, right? That's what deja vu essentially is. So it's just your brain rationalizing why you feel like something's familiar, and it just says it's the thing you just looked at, whatever it might be. So that probably didn't help a lot of you, but some of you, I think, might have gotten it. All right. Somebody besides, because uh, uh, you've already explained it, somebody besides uh, Rush, I want to explain it, take a shot at it. So did you lose like a material favorite? Retrieval. Retrieval failure in your brain, and so instead it associates that moment, like, it's like, oh, it was this when it really wasn't, because there's like an association with that. Why is it trying to rationalize it and associate it? Associate it? Um, be, like, okay, so like you explained the left and right, right? Mm -hmm. So like, if it's missing a piece of information, it's gonna try to rationalize it, so like, for example, with that experiment thing, it was like, Oh, go get up, and then they'd be like, okay, but why did you get up? And it's like, oh, you get a coat, even though yeah, there's no reason. Yeah, exactly. Your brain doesn't go, I don't know. It just makes stuff up, essentially. Uh, it rationalizes uh, why it's doing something. 
right? So because it failed to retrieve the me uh, memory, I still have this feeling of remembering something, but I don't know what I remember, so your brain just says, this is what you saw, this thing you're looking at now. It's the second time you've seen it, even though it's almost certainly not. Okay, <laughs> that's retrieval failure in deja vu. Um, moving on, though, uh, there are factors that can make it less likely for me to remember something, whether it's a new memory or an old memory. All right, and this, I'm not talking amnesia, I'm just talking about factors that can make it more difficult, right? So kind of like if I got bad sleep, I'm less likely to remember something. This is the same thing. Just because I slept bad and my memory sucks for that day, does it mean I have amnesia? No, it just means something interfered with my memory process. So I can still function normally, but it's just uh, uh, something's interfering with it, making it not as effective. So there's two types, and the, this is often confused by people between the two types. Maybe this will help you out, I don't know. With, uh, it's not even a good mnemonic necessarily, but it's more a semantic like word meaning thing. So the first one, so these are interferences. Things that don't prevent you from remembering things like amnesia, like I can't do it, but they make it harder. So one is a proactive interference. Does anybody know what proactive means or proactivity? Because this will help you, I think, if you know the meaning of the word, it'll help you remember this type of memory or interference. Anybody knows what proactive means? Well, you know what active means? What's active mean? You're yeah, you're productive. You're doing something. All right. So proactive means like you're acting in advance. You're trying to prevent something. Uh, so you're trying to prevent something new from happening. What, what, like let's say a bad thing. So if I don't want to get a bad score on a test, what could I? How could I be proactive? Study. study for it, right? I know this test is coming up. I want to avoid a bad grade. So me being proactive prepares me for that future event. So it's, it's trying to prevent something from the future, uh, from something bad from happening, right? Or promoting a good thing. So proactive meaning acting for the future, trying to prevent something in the future, something bad. Uh, this is when an old memory that you already have uh, inhibits or prevents a new memory. Right, so that's, that's why they attach this uh, term to it as far as proactive, because it's something you already have and you're, you're preventing something uh, new uh, in the future. So uh, an example of this, and if you haven't experienced this, you definitely will. If you have a password for a, a, a site uh, or an app or even just your phone password, when you switch it, it makes it really hard to remember your new password. Why? Yeah, like you're brain is associating the situation, entering the password for this app or whatever, uh, with a specific memory. Uh, so it's going to keep going back to that, uh, even though you've made this new memory. So it's possible, but it's just harder to do. Uh, and that happens to all of us. It's really hard to remember uh, the new passwords we made um, because we have that old password just embedded in there. Uh, and that's, that's proactive interference. So an old, already present memory makes it really hard to form a new memory or association. Okay, um, this can happen with um, names. Uh, if you, oh, here's a great example. This happens to me. I'm surprised I haven't done this to you. Uh, uh, those of you that have same sex uh, uh, siblings, you're like a couple, three years apart usually. It's really hard for us teachers to uh, not call you by your sibling's name uh, because you look not exactly the same, but you look a little bit the same. Like you have, usually a similar voice and similar mannerisms. So like our brains go, uh, uh, oh, that's this person who we originally met. Like, so if I had your older sibling first, it's just in my brain that this person that's kind of like you, that's the name. So when I go to say, hey, whatever your name is, the odds that I say your older sibling's name are, are higher uh, than uh, your actual name, which I don't think I've done to you, right? Yes. Uh, I, haven't, I, I haven't done that either to, uh, 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 Varen Deep either, because uh, he had a he has an older sibling, uh, Karen Deep, and they they're similar uh, in in body uh, body uh, not body tone, proportions. not body proportions either, body language. Why couldn't I think of that word? Like body language and, and kind of how they act too. I've had people tell this about me and my brother as well, so I know it's true. But yeah, and my brother always complained about that because he was two years, two and a half years younger, and he's like his teachers would always call him. Uh, his name's Dustin, and my name's Michael. They always call him Michael. Like I mean, Dustin, they do that all the time to him. <laughs> It never happened to me because mine was the first name to get in there. They associate that and then they accidentally call him that. 
uh, which is why that happens. <clears throat> so that's proactive interference. Uh, that can be, that can get you in trouble too, <laughs> if like you've had a girlfriend for a long time, and their name's like embedded in your head, and then you get a new girlfriend. The odds that you will eventually accidentally call them by the other name are are high. And it doesn't mean you have these feelings that are you know still with the old person. <laughs> That's not what it means at all. But the the your your mood and your interactions. Uh, are associated with this name, so the odds that name's just gonna come out automatically are high. So again, don't take that the wrong way if you or your significant other does that on accident. It doesn't mean that you or they are secretly yearning for that other person they were with. That's not what it means. It's just, it's just an old memory that's locked in. It's gonna take a long time to, to go away. All right, um, that's proactive. So what's retroactive then? Interference. This one's harder. <clears throat> Retroactive is when new memories like mess up your old memories. So you yep. have new ones so you can't remember your old ones. Correct. So if it can uh, interfere one way, it can also interfere the other way, and it, and it can. So this is when a new memory inhibits uh, retrieval of a, uh, an old memory. <clears throat> <coughs> All the situations I gave can also be true in the reverse. Um, it can be harder to remember your older passwords because what's now uh, in your brain after a while? The new one you have, right. Uh, you can uh, screw up and like if I saw your older sister, there might be a chance I call her by your name uh, because I've seen you more recently, more frequently. Uh, or same thing with Varen Deep and Karen Deep. The odds that I do that, uh, I don't wanna say how high, if they're higher, but, they, but it, it can also happen. Um, here's a good example, too, of, uh, of this. We've all been trapped in this before. Let's say we all know, what's the song everyone knows? It's got to be super common. I'm blanking on... Um, Baby shark. Baby shark. Fair enough. Okay. Baby shark. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we've all heard that. All right. Okay. So that, that, that's a song. Um, let's say you just hear that song and it's stuck in your head. Um, are you going to, uh, is it going to be harder or easier to remember the lyrics to other songs you already know? Harder, right? Because this new, let's just say you heard Baby Shark for the first time and it's stuck in your head. When you have a new song stuck in your head, it's really hard to remember how other songs go, whether it's the beat or the lyrics or whatever. So let's say I just introduced you to Baby Shark and it's stuck in your head. I'm like, okay, uh, sing the Bee Gees, Staying Alive, go. And like, it'd be harder for you to do that. You can do it now, I get it, you're also special. <laughs> and that's actually a really easy one to remember, but uh, you can use it for anything. It's hard to remember the lyrics uh, to those songs when that new one is currently stuck in your head. All right, but it's the same thing, but in reverse. Uh, if you have a new one that you're using frequently, it can make it harder to remember the older uh, name in, uh, as a result. Okay, so those are the two types of interference. So proactive, if it helps, remember, that's what you do to prevent something uh, from happening, in this case, a new memory uh, from forming. That helped me remember it. Um, that, that's one way uh, to do it. Uh, or retroactive, retro means back. It's hard to remember the old one. That Maybe that helps you, I don't know. Those are various mnemonics you might be able to use but people do confuse them frequently. Okay, um, what else is there, misinformation? Okay, misinformation. This is a sad one, and I'm not even talking about uh, degenerative uh, neurocognitive disorders, which people experience later in life, like Alzheimer's or dementia, things like that. Uh, misinformation happens to all of us. So unfortunately, your childhood that you remember 60% of it didn't happen, or it happened differently than you remember it. I think that's the statistic. It might, have, it might be 40%, it's one or the other. It's either 60% of it's inaccurate or 60% of it's accurate, I can't remember which, but just, we'll just say roughly half of your childhood memories are either wrong or not entirely right. So you might, and it might be that like something happens, like you remember, oh here, here's an example. I remember when I was in first grade, I, I did something and so like the, the teachers when they were mad at you when you did something, they would like make you stand on the fence like as like a timeout sort of thing. So you have to go over to the fence pole and stand there for however long until they let you off. And so I, I did something, I don't remember what it was. And uh, I'm on the fence serving my punishment and this girl runs up to me 
and she's like, oh, the teacher said you can get off now. And I was like, oh, they did? And she's like, yeah. I was like, okay. So I go, I go off the fence and I go and play. And then my teacher uh, gets mad at me and then I get another one on top of it. In fact, I think I'd go to the principal for that, um, which was really bad. Uh, and I was mad at the girl. And I remember that scenario. I know what happened, but I don't remember who the girl was, what she looked like, which teacher it was, or anything. All I remember is I was upset, and this is part of the long-term uh, potentiation, I was pissed that this girl lied to me and I got in extra trouble. And I remember being lied to, feeling very angry at the girl, and then uh, having to go to the principal's office and I, that, that dread that I know it's gonna go on my parents and I'm not gonna be able to explain it to them, they're not gonna believe me, that sort of thing. So I lost <clears throat> a lot of the details like, I had this image in my head of what the girl looked like, but she almost certainly didn't look like that. Uh, and I don't remember what the teacher looked like or which one it was, but I know it happened. So the fu <clears throat> fuzzier your memories get, uh, the less accurately you remember them. And what's worse is these memories start blending with other memories that weren't even actually related. Uh, so you can uh, accidentally add details that didn't happen uh, or you can accidentally omit things that did happen, or you can take two memories that were totally separated and somehow blend the details together even though they didn't, weren't actually related. Uh, and this does happen over time, uh, no matter what. It's similar to, you ever played that stupid phone game where you like have a bunch of people and <clears throat> you say a sentence into the ear of the one person and then it goes back around. Oh, telephone. telephone, yeah. I said stupid phone game, same thing. So. Uh, <laughs> It goes around and it comes back and it's always different. And I know people intentionally screw it up to be like, oh, you know, but even if you try, uh, the words are gonna be different and sometimes even the meaning is different. It's similar to that. Every time I recall a memory, if I accidentally screw up or blur or add a detail, even if it was unintentional, guess what my new memory now is? That, right, that imperfect version. And that, just, that happens over time multiple times, just like the telephone game. And by the time it's 20 years later, I'm recalling the memory, who knows which details are right or wrong? Uh, probably the overall thing is correct. Like, I definitely know that happened, but the details attached to it, I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember why I got put on the fence, uh, but I, I do remember that it happened, and that's all I remember. So that happens over time. So some things didn't happen. Some things were actually dreams, which you misremember as a memory. Uh, some things were stories you heard that you actually blended into a memory of yours that aren't actually true. Uh, that's what it actually is. So uh, our memory, it's distorted over time, essentially. And that's a really easy one to, uh, to study. You basically just ask people about certain events and then they recall it and then you have like video <laughs> footage of the event uh, and then it's, it's pretty clear which parts of their memory were embellished or falsified or just misinformed over time. Like for example, uh, they do this historical events too, like a uh, Tiananmen Square massacre or uh, um, the, uh, the, the uh, what's his name, the, riot, the race riots, because they, Rodney King uh, riots, things like that. They ask people details about these events and they give these you know, testimonies and then they look at what actually happened, like the video footage and all that. Uh, and of course it ends up being completely different because over time your memory distorts uh, towards you know, various biases you have that you want to be true or things that you don't want to be true or you mix memories together or, or whatever. So it's totally imperfect. Um, yeah. Is this like the Mandela effect? <clears throat> Similar to it, yeah. Uh, that one's like a collective phenomenon. That one's weirder. This could happen to any individual with any memory. The Mandela effect that you're talking about is where a whole bunch of people agree with an untrue or false memory. Like, for example, a whole bunch of people. Oh, there's two actually. You guys heard the Bernstein Bears one? Yeah. Okay. So Everyone knows that so one, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. But that's a collective misinformation episode. So that's, that's the one that's a little weirder when a whole bunch of people misremember the same thing. Then people are like, time travelers, ooh, and all that crap. But um, yeah, the Mandela effect was the one where like at least half of people thought that he died in prison uh, and they were just sure that he died in prison. But what likely happened is they found out about how he was treated in the 60s because he was trying to have a Marxist revolution in South Africa. And I don't remember the exact details of why he got arrested, but I'm sure they weren't as clear cut as the government made it sound at the time. Regardless, he got put in prison. And I, I know a lot of people, because he was part of a radical group and the government did not like it at the time, they probably just assumed he was going to die in prison or, or did die in prison. And then their memory of him dying in prison was just what their assumption was in the 1960s and 70s. 
that they all misremembered. Nonetheless, a good chunk of people were sure he died in prison, even though he didn't. And he came back out, of course, ran for public office and helped South Africa heal. And now it's kind of unhealing itself. But nonetheless, uh, uh, that, that's, that's an example of a collective misinformation. So those ones are weirder. If you misremember something and then nine of us remember it correctly, yeah, that can happen to anybody. But when, when we have an event and half of you remember this false version, but you have the same story and half of you remember the correct version of the same story, that's weirder. Uh, when that happened. Uh, but yeah, the other one's the Berenstein Bears one. Uh, where, and I remember it being Berenstain. No, no, Berenstain, but it's Berenstain. Uh, and that could just be an example of the, the Stein from German is so common that even if you put stain, like Berenstain instead of Berenstain, let me write it. <laughs> I might actually be spelling the first part. I can't remember if it's Berenstain or Berenstein, but let's pretend that this is correct. Uh, it's like, I think that's the actual spelling, but most people remember it as Bernstein, like Bernstein, or maybe it's Steen, like this, whatever it is. They remember it like with the EI instead of the AI, and people are like shocked when they find out that it's the AI and first, like, no, it was Bernstein, no way. It's actually Bernstein. Uh, but for what they, they believe, it's just a common uh, uh, error that we make from reading things because we don't actually look at every letter. Our brain looks at the pattern of the letters and just tells us what the word is. That's why I can actually write words like this. I'm sure you've seen this before. Like I can write words and you can instantaneously uh, read them correctly so long as the, uh, the, the letters are, are correct inside. So I could write, um, um, this is actually kind of hard to do. Yeah, I misspelled it completely, but it's really, it's instantaneously obvious. I could write a whole paragraph like this, and you could seamlessly read it as if I spelled it all correctly. So some people believe that it's this, uh, and they're probably right. There are so many German words that are like this that uh, your brain just automatically reads that and assumes that that's the same order uh, and the same letters, even though it's actually Stein, not Stein. Uh, but that's, that might explain it. But I was part of it. I remember somebody asked me, he's like, yeah, it's Berenstein. And they're like, nope, it's Baron Stain. I was like, what? <laughs> like, I thought for sure that's what it was. But anyways, so those are probably both examples of people misinterpreting it initially. And then, of course, that's going to have a false memory because they were, sh they were like, oh, yeah, he's going to die in prison because they're going to make sure he doesn't come back out. Or, oh, yeah, your brain just reads that as a common German spelling. So Baron Stain instead of Baron Stain. Or, oh, yeah, he's probably going to die turns 30 years later. Like, yeah, he died, right? Like, but that's not what actually happened. <clears throat> Anyways, that's misinformation. So you can uh, misinterpret something, misremember something, very, very common. But you can actually cause somebody to have a false memory based on the wording that you use. All right, this was found out by um, um, Loftus, right? Elizabeth Loftus, that's her name. I can't remember if she was either studying attorneys or she was an attorney. It was one of the two. I, I forget which one it was. Regardless, she made a, a, a discovery that is a psychological uh, discovery. So Elizabeth Loftus, again, I can't remember if she's an attorney or she was studying attorneys, but she found out that you could actually distort somebody's memory based on the wording you used in questioning. And this was important because she found out that lawyers can actually get you to falsely remember things. All right, and they can do so by the words they use. So they would have people watch this video of a car crash in which there was no fire and uh, I can't remember if there was broken glass or not. I don't think there was. So there, so it's like a basic car crash that doesn't have a fire and doesn't have like broken glass everywhere. Okay, so it's just like almost not quite like a fender bender, but like boom, they hit, but there's not just like glass all over. There's not fire, none of that stuff. It's just a basic accident. All right. So they watched this clip, and then they uh, later on would would release these questions about the video, and they would ask them to describe it. And based on the way they described the the, the questions or worded the questions affected the way people remembered it. I can't remember the exact details, but it was something like this. Some of the questions were like, uh, what happened in the accident? And then the other question was something like this. What, or the other version of it? So this would be like, I don't know, the control group. And this is the experimental group where they changed the word deliberately. They're technically both experimental because it's you're looking to see which one they respond to. But nonetheless, 
Uh, so that's it. what happened in the accident, and then uh, the other one is what happened in the collision. Is that the same meaning, roughly? Yeah, yeah it is. What's the difference? Which one seems more severe? Collision. The collision, right. So what, what, what were we going to say about this? Okay, but what do you think, uh, how do you think these people described it as opposed to these people? Because accident is like not on purpose, and collision True. seems like on purpose. Collision doesn't have to be on purpose, but <coughs> this seems more like, oh yeah, it was no problem, it's just an accident. This sounds like, oh, something bad happened. All right, so they found out that the group that had the wording that was more implied, it was more severe, actually misremembered the accident itself more severely. So for example, these people did a more, had a more accurate description of what the accident was like, but these people falsely remembered details like shattered glass uh, and fire. And um, it wasn't just like one or two people, it was like most people described it this way, uh, and then most people in this one described it less, less severe without broken glass and fire and things like that. So I'm not saying that nobody here thought that there was shattered glass. It just means that a lot more people that had this wording, despite seeing the same video uh, and being part of a, 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 a randomly selected, randomly assigned group, uh, incorrectly remembered shattered glass and fire in this one. So what impacted their uh, false memories here, this misinformation? The wording, right. So that what this means by extension is if I'm a lawyer, and I want you to remember some details that help my case, what could I do? I could ask the same question, but use different wording, right? So I could make the question seem less severe. That's more likely to have you remember it less severely. And I could ask you a, uh, in a phrase that's more condemning or more uh, violent or more severe sounding, and it might actually alter your memory uh, to make it sound more, make the person sound more guilty or less guilty or, or, or whatever. Does that make sense? All right, so that's why our memory isn't perfect. And by the way, this is why most of the time they don't, witness testimonies aren't that, aren't weighed that heavily, especially if it's just one or two people. But if you have a whole bunch of people that witness it, it's a lot more accurate, generally speaking. Uh, because even though this person, this person, this person might misremember it, if the other eight people you ask all have the same story, and these three are the only ones that deviate, it's probably... Uh, what the eight people said as opposed to the three. Uh, so that's why we, we try to go for like volume on a, on a consensus. This is also a good idea uh, socially because this kind of uh, calibrates us for society. Like if I'm a little crazy and I think some weird things or remember weird things, uh, what can kind of keep me from becoming too crazy? How? How could society do that? Yeah, exactly. It makes you step back and be like, whoa, maybe I'm misremembering this, or maybe I'm a little crazy, right? Because these people all disagree together. Um, so it makes you at least think about it. doesn't mean that they're all right. It probably does. Uh, but it helps, like, keep you sane. So all those crazy thoughts, memories you have, if people are like, oh, no, that didn't happen, that kind of, like, keeps you uh, uh, from, from becoming a victim of your own misinformation or misconception abilities. Doesn't that apply like when you're like um, accused in like court or something and then like everyone like accused you for these memories like that could impact your like in perception? It could potentially, uh, but what this does is, it, like I said, it helps calibrate you. It's not perfect, but it's better than just you. Because we know if we just follow one person's thoughts or memories, they just go right off the rail. Uh, that's why we kind of need other people to keep us in check uh, with, with what is acceptable or what actually happened or, or a more realistic version of what happened or whatever. Uh, so that's why it can work as a, uh, to our favor. You guys got that? All right, take a break, then we'll, do, we'll start problem solving. <coughs>